Hello, and welcome to the first online segment of the Supported Employment Core Training Series. This session will provide an overview of traditional supported employment, the OBR process, and what is involved. We will dig more deeply into the how-tos of providing this service when you attend the sessions in person. There are three types of supported employment funded by Vocational Rehabilitation in Kentucky, traditional, IPS, and customized. IPS is also known as Individualized Placement and Support, and it can only be provided by those agencies selected to do so. Customized employment, while we will talk about later, can be a tool for anyone in order to bill for customized employment through that particular service fee memo with the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation, the employment specialist needs to have attended additional trainings to this one and received national certifications in that area. Following completion of the online segments, you will complete session one and two in person in Lexington. The goal in supported employment is to help someone who has a significant impact to disability figure out what a good job could be, help them get that job, and support them to maintain the job and move forward in their career. As you will continue to learn, supported employment is far more than asking someone where they want to work and then helping them fill out applications. This training series will provide context and direction for your work to help people who too often have had low expectations and perhaps been presumed unemployable to be able to find good jobs. The key to supported employment is what we call person-centered job selection. It is the idea of taking time to really get to know the job seeker so that you can then go out and represent that person well to a potential employer. The how-tos of these tasks, again, will be covered much more in depth in the in-person sessions. Supported employment is a service funded initially by the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation that supports someone to find what is defined as competitive integrated employment. This means the work will be done in a typical business where people without disabilities also work, making the prevailing wage, which would always be at least the minimum wage. It is not a service to help people find jobs at a business that specifically targets hiring people with disabilities. Today, we're gonna to focus on the process and documentation through the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation. It is also known as VR, OVR, Voc Rehab, Counselors in this agency tend to refer to their clients as consumers, so that's another term that you will hear. Office of Vocational Rehabilitation now also includes the Division of Blind Services. So whether someone has a counselor within that Division of Blind Services or a general OVR counselor, all of the paperwork and process is the same. It is the same state agency. Everyone starts their service within the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation. We know that some of the people you support also receive services from other agencies. VR provides supported employment and is the for first source of funding here in Kentucky, particularly for those of you serving people who receive a Medicaid waiver, known as SCL, Supports for Community Living, Michelle P, or ABI, the Acquired Brain Injury. Medicaid is always the payer of last resort. So you must bill services to Voc Rehab before you can bill a Medicaid waiver for supported employment. This online will session will discuss when you can switch to that Medicaid funding or other funding. Just as a reminder, you also received a link to the online Dropbox that contains a wealth of information and resources about providing supported employment that we will reference continually through this core training series. In your Dropbox, you'll find a folder marked VR Documentation and Process. Within that folder is another subfolder called Traditional Supported Employment. This is where you will find all the documentation that we will discuss during this segment. Just as an initial overview, the sequence of services provided by VR include a referral to Voc Rehab. So if somebody receives services through you and isn't a client of VR yet, that's what this process is. Person-centered job selection, or the greater term in the field is called discovery, this idea of who is this person and getting to know them to figure out the good characteristics of a job. Job development, once you've figured out what a good job could be and what kind of business is gonna be the best fit for this person, it's making those connections in the community with employers who could fit that where the 
employee could be success and be a real benefit to that company. Job acquisition is actually starting the job, learning, orientation, getting used to it, and becoming stable and independent. And then follow up. What makes supported employment unique is this idea of long-term supports, not just through those first 90 and then 180 days, but down the road as well. In order to become a client of the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation, you need to call your local office to schedule an appointment. You'll meet with a voc rehab counselor. Just as a point of courtesy, if you've helped someone to make this appointment and you know they're not gonna be able to make it, please make sure you call the office ahead of time to cancel. Sometimes it can take a while to get that appointment and so you wanna cancel and reschedule as soon as possible if you know that will be the case. You can help someone become a consumer or client at Boat Re Voc Rehab. They can also call on their own or they can go in with a family member or friend. When someone does go for that eligibility appointment, it's a good idea to take as many of the things on the screen that you see as possible. The VR counselor will need to acquire documentation to verify the impact of disability. One, to figure out if they're eligible for VR services, and if they are, for which type of service they are eligible for. The more of this current and relevant information that the applicant, your job seeker, can bring in, the faster that eligibility process could go. So the more you can bring in is really helpful. Here's some of the set guidelines for receiving services through vocational rehabilitation. You have to have a physical or mental impairment that results in a substantial impediment to employment. VR is an agency that exists to help people with an impact of disability return to the workforce or enter the workforce for the first time. The VR counselor is the person responsible for making this determination of eligibility. VR offers lots of different services. This training series focuses specifically on supported employment. Just so you know, eligibility has to be determined within 60 days of that appointment. Otherwise, the applicant has to sign a waiver saying that they accept an extension. But again, the more relevant current information that person can bring with them, the faster that process is. This is a list. You will refer to this several more times throughout the course of this online training, and you have it in your Dropbox. It's a list of the documentation, that's required for each phase of process and when invoices from your agency get turned into Office of Vocational Rehabilitation. You can see more of this list here. And we're gonna show examples of it in a bit in, the, in just a moment. I'll let you look over what the steps are. The first phase, Kentucky calls person-centered job selection. The point of person-centered job selection is to really get to know the job seeker so that that job selection is based upon who that individual is. Supported employment really gets at the heart of finding a job that's a good match for that particular person. It's not, here's a list of businesses I happen to have good relationships with, which one of those would you want to work? We start with who the person is, and then we go out and develop relationships and context to find a position that's gonna fit what that person has to offer and the type of culture where they're gonna be most successful. The place we learn what that could look like, or the time we learn where that could look like, is during this person-centered job selection phase. Your agency, in accepting that referral, will receive an authorization from the VR counselor to begin this process. I will encourage you to make sure that your agency receives that authorization. That's your agency's way of knowing that VR is asking you, your agency to provide this service, and then upon completion, they will pay you the agreed upon amount. Person Center Job Selection is a series of what they refer to as activities. It's a time of getting to know someone. Every time you meet with someone or on behalf of someone, maybe with a family member, a former teacher, you document that on what they call a PSEP activity note. PSEP refers to the Person Centered Employment Plan, which is what you will turn in at the end of this Person Centered Job Selection 
phase. And so they call that documentation a PSEP activity note because what you learn in each of those activities and meetings is the information that will be summarized in that person-centered employment plan, the PSEP. So again, these activity notes are gonna be written up and ways that you are spending time getting to know that person in different aspects of their life. You want to start with new places or start with places where they're familiar and then you move into the new. You want to talk to other people who are important to him or her, review records, and spend quality time observing and learning about different parts of their life. The person-centered employment plan is expected within 75 days of that authorization. This is the content that goes on the PSEP activity note. You wanna make sure, or that'll be in a moment. You wanna make sure that you complete one note per activity. All of your notes get turned in on a monthly basis. So for example, all of your October notes will need to be turned in by the 5th of November. If no contact was made, you wanna create a note of attempts to make contact or to give a reason why somebody wasn't wanting to participate that particular month and when you're gonna pick up service again so that the counselor knows that you are on the ball and know what's going on. Kentucky Office of Vocational Rehabilitation requires that you spend a minimum of 10 hours with or on behalf of that job seeker during this phase of service. Average for best practice is around 20 to 24. 10 hours is a minimum. This is what the PSEP activity note looks like. You can see the different categories on it. The categories, overall categories are the same for all of the documentation VR requires. You have the person's name, the discovery activity, what was it you did with or on behalf of that job seeker to get to know them better on that particular day, and then the purpose why this activity for this particular person? Because the activities you do in person-centered job selection will vary from client to client because people are different and their preferences are different. And then the results, what was it you learned? This is the substance, the biggest part of your note. And then next steps, and be as specific as possible here. When will you meet again? What are you going to do? And the more detail you can include, the more momentum you're likely to keep in this process and the less likely you are to stall with larger gaps of time in between. I do want to point out that underneath the heading of each portion of this note, there's an italicized statement. Always in the VR documentation, those italicized statements are giving you a prompt as to what it is they are looking for, and you do have to complete every area of the note for each activity. This is an example of how not to write a note. Your notes need to have enough information to be useful. You, anybody else who might also work with this person in your agency, your supervisor and the VR counselor should be able to read these notes and understand what it was you did and what you learned about this person. While the information on this particular note is true, it is not enough written information so as to be helpful in the job search process down the road. The person-centered employment plan, this is the big document that you will write up to summarize all of the information you've learned during person-centered job selection. It really is more than just a report. It is a plan that will guide your job development. It should be completed within 75 days from that initial authorization and it should be submitted within two weeks of your final PSEP activity note. Again, that way you keep your momentum in working with this person. It gets turned into your voc rehab counselor, the PSEP, all of your PSEP activity notes to that point in the month with an invoice pay made payable to your agency for $900. Once you've completed a person-centered employment plan, it should be clear what type of work you're looking for, where you're going to look for that, who your contact person is, and why you're going to that particular company. We'll go through briefly the content sections of the person-centered employment plan, and we'll spend more time digging into these in the in-person training that you'll come to later in this series. General information is the first section. We need background information about the job seeker, family or other key people in their life, where they lived, who do they live with, other community involvement. 
and general information about disability and how it might impact employment and how work is gonna improve the quality of this person's life. We also want you to list their employment history. What jobs have they had? school transition jobs or work experiences they might have had in school, volunteer work that they might have had. And then as a part of that, be sure to address what was it that worked well about that work or that volunteer experience? And then what didn't work so well and why? The why is really crucial. You can learn from both what's worked well in the past and what did not work well in the past. And that can give you as the employment specialist some pretty good direction as to what you are looking for in a job and in a workplace culture and what you want to make sure that you can avoid if at all possible. As in all parts of the person-centered employment plan, the more robust and rich your information, the better the plan is going to be and the more sure you're going to be of direction once you get into job development phase. You want to identify this person's interests. What do they like to do and what do they do well? How do people choose to spend their time and what do other people say that they like to do and do well? Sometimes we aren't always the best at answering that question about ourselves, so you want to make sure that you're talking to other people that know this job seeker as well as long as you have permission to speak to them, of course. You want to identify that spark. What gets this person excited and motivated? It might be that somebody um, might not be as engaged in the conversation at first. And what is it that gets them more engaged and willing to be a part of this? Those are the kind of things you're looking for. And you want to include how you learned about that. Where do they take place in these? How do you know that this is really an interest of this person? You have to show evidence. And then we want to talk about skills. What is this person good at? What kind of things do they do on a regular basis? What do other people say that they're good at? What skills have they seen in this person? And again, how did you learn about these skills? Where did you see them? And what type of settings? And what do people have to say about it? You have to show evidence. As the employment specialist, you are likely going to be representing this person to an employer down the road, and you're gonna to need to be able to share what somebody is good at and what gets them excited and motivated to work. And if even if you aren't the person who's gonna be going out, say they'll be representing themselves, it's your responsibility to make sure that that job seeker is ready to go out and express these kind of things clearly. So you wanna make sure that you really figure out what those are during this person-centered job selection time, which is your time to learn all about that. In the big picture, we wanna figure out when this person is at their best. And then based upon those skills and interests, we wanna translate into what job tasks do you think this person can and will be able to do? And you wanna make sure the task matches the skills and interests. Just because somebody has the skill to stock shelves doesn't mean that they have an interest to do so. So you really wanna make sure that you're looking at that big, big picture around this person. And it's our job to be that translator. Again, supported employment is way more than asking somebody, where do you wanna work or what do you wanna do? We are being paid to provide this service. And so it's our job to figure out what does this person have to offer and what are their interests and where are they at their best? And so what path can I see them doing? And then we're gonna get down to what type of business do you think would be the best fit? Person-centered job selection is all about planning for your job development time. You also want to think about what kind of considerations are you looking for in a job. So in addition to the task, what about all that other stuff? The lighting, the noise, the pace, the personalities, the supervisory style. Are they really into quantity and how fast you work? Are they really into quality and the accuracy of what's being done? Do people kind of do it, do the job however they want as long as they get the end result? Or is the business really tight on method and has specific expectations as to how the work gets done? You want to know what's going to work best for this particular person so that when during job development, you both know what you're looking for in the culture and the way that business operates. What are someone's preferences and what are their deal breakers? Are there schedule requirements that they really have to meet? Um, or are there things that, well, well, I'd like to work nine to five, I could work earlier or later if I needed to. Oh, 
I might not love working weekends, but I could work weekends here and there. What are those preferences and what are the deal breakers? For example, if someone has to take their medication in the evening and one of the side effects is it makes someone really drowsy, it's possible that they're not gonna be able to work a really early shift and you're gonna have to find something that starts after the effect of that medication has worn off enough that they can get up and get ready and out the door to go to work. You wanna know how this person learns best. Do they learn best through written instruction, verbal instruction, modeling, a mixture of modeling and verbal instruction? Because if you know how this person learns best, then you can already be thinking about how to facilitate learning on the job down the road. You wanna know how many hours a week a person is looking for and how much money they want to earn. You're gonna get a lot more information about the impact of wages on benefits. So I want to encourage you to not put part-time so they can keep their SSI, um, but really think about the earning potential this person is looking for, what they wanna be able to do with money, and how many hours a week they wanna work. Because that's what you, the type of job that you'll need to be helping them to look for. The plan of action is just that. Once this piece up is approved, what are you gonna do and where are you going so you are ready to hit the ground running during job development? Job personalities, based upon everything you've learned, what are those things that you're, those places of employment that you're looking for, right? So a specific list of potential companies, tasks that you're looking for, and who you're gonna contact in that business is helpful to have. Representational considerations, this gets at what's your role gonna be in that job search process. You wanna have these conversations now during person-centered job selection because you need to know if you're gonna be going out with someone, are they gonna take the lead in conversation? Are you taking the lead? If the employer asks why you're there, how are you gonna answer that question? Is this person gonna disclose? And how do they want to disclose legally? Only the job applicant is allowed to disclose their disability. If you are going to do so, then you need permission from that person to disclose an impact of disability on their behalf. You can see in your Dropbox, there is a representational considerations form. It is optional. You do not have to use this form, but it can be a really helpful guide to have a conversation with a job seeker <clears throat> about what you can say and when you can say it. It's possible they don't want you to use a diagnostic label, but to describe the impact of disability in more functional terms. This is a conversation that needs to be had ahead of time before you start talking to employers. And then what kind of on-the-job supports do you foresee somebody needing? Remember, you are not even looking for jobs yet. You're still in person-centered job selection time. But you should know this person enough now to know what kind of supports they're likely to need. How is someone gonna need to learn? What type of instruction are they going to need to have? For example, are they gonna need you to help them get to know other people on the job site? If they have a hard time making connections and getting to know coworkers, maybe it's somebody who's gonna really benefit from having a specific mentor within that company that they know they can go and ask questions to. Um, Understanding that now and foreseeing what might be needed on the job is what you're looking for. And then are there other support services that will need to be lined up before this person is working? Transportation is a big one. If there are other regular appointments, physical therapy appointments, mental health appointments, that somebody's gonna need to make sure that they maintain in order to be healthy and be able to go to work. Do you foresee any accommodations down the road? It might be that someone's gonna need a certain type of software, or maybe they're looking at working in a place with a real routine schedule, but they aren't great at telling time, so you're gonna to wanna to make sure they have a device, a watch, a phone, a something that can set a schedule and give them alarms and prompts to do what needs to be done at a certain time. It's a good time to foresee those things so you can have them lined up when they do start. And already you wanna think about that plan for fading. The goal of supported employment is always independence on the job. While you might, you might be there to help them get started, help them make connections, help them learn the job, your time should be fading, should be getting less as time goes on. Any other important information you can list in this section of the person-centered employment plan. This is the only section that you are allowed to leave blank. 
other than this one section, if you have nothing else to add, you have to complete all of the parts of the Pursuit Center and Employment Plan. And again, those italicized sentences are there to give you prompts as to what they're looking for for each section of this plan. You want to have your signature and your contact information. Your total time spent means you're going to add up the amount of time from all of those PSEP activity notes so that the VR counselor knows how much time you spent getting to know this person over the course of this phase of service, person-centered job selection. You have to spend a minimum of 10 hours with or on behalf of this person before you can turn in this person-centered employment plan. But again, I stress that's a minimum and not the set number of hours that you are to spend. If down the road, you learn something new about this person and want to change the vocational goal, this is when you would contact that VR counselor and submit an addendum amendment or modification. It's also possible that you're new in this job and somebody has already turned in a person-centered employment plan from a different employment specialist and now that you get to know the person you want to change the goal, that would be a good time that you could write up this modification and not have to redo the full plan. These are some questions to consider of having written the person-centered employment plan. As you go back and read over what you've wrote, use this list of questions and proofreading it. It'd also be a good list of questions for your supervisor to use, just to make sure that it's all laid out, it's easy to read, it's clearly defined as to what's gonna happen once job development starts. If there's still questions, then you probably need to go back and fill in more information in this plan. It's really easy to have all this information in your head. Sometimes it's a little trickier at first to get it all down onto the paper. So there are people, supervisors, VR counselors, supported employment consultants who can help with this, who might say, can you tell me more about what you meant in this section? They're not trying to be critical, but just looking for, again, that robustness and richness of information to make sure that the plan is complete before you move into the next phase of service. The next phase of service is your documentation for job development. So job development comes next, and we're gonna talk about what's required in this phase. Once that PSEP is approved, you're gonna start job development. Every time you get together with, on behalf of the job seeker, you're gonna write up a job development activity note. These activities should be coming from the direction that you specified while doing person-centered job selection and wrote up in that person-centered employment plan. Again, you'll complete one note per activity, turn them all to the counselor by, on a monthly basis. So all of your notes for one month need to be turned in by the fifth of the following month. If no contact was made for some reason, you need a list of attempts to make contact or a reason why. Say somebody's been in the hospital or they had a death in the family and they wanna take some time off or they've had to travel, that might be a reason that you haven't made contact during that month and you just need to let the counselor know. This is your time when you're networking with employers. You might be conducting informational interviews to get to know the place better, see if it would be a good fit, and then helping the employee to apply for a job. All of that happens during this time and it gets written up on the job development notes. Once somebody gets a job, after that first day of employment, you'll turn in all those notes up to that point in the month, the work summary job start plan, and an invoice for $900. This is what the job development note looks like. You'll see the format is the same as the PSEP activity note. But again, there are the italicized parts about what goes in each heading for this note. So a job development activity might be going out and shadowing a job site. It might be talking to an employer to learn more about what the expectations for employment are, what kind of things are employees expected to do, or it might be other activity. You might be looking for interview clothes. You might be writing a resume. You might be doing mock interviews and interview prep skills with somebody. All of that can fit as a job development activity. Again, the purpose, why this place for employment or this other activity, and then what did you learn about the job seeker, but also what did you learn about that place of business is really important to put down here. And then again, your next steps. 
So if someone does get a job, you're very excited, call the voc rehab counselor and let them know that this person has been offered a job. And then again, once they actually start after the first day of work, then you turn in that work summary and job start plan, along with the notes to that point and the invoice for job development. This is what the work summary job start plan looks like. It gives a lot of logistical information about the employee, the employer, a job description. You can either attach a job description or give a list of the duties that the person is responsible for on the job, any benefits that they're going to receive, and then anything else that the counselor needs to know in order to assist this person or be made aware of. In supported employment, there is the expectation of long-term supports. You must touch base with a supported employee at least two times per month, and one of those should be in person. That's ongoing over the course of this person's vocational life, unless you apply for step-down supports after a year of stability on the job, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Just as a reminder, you would only visit the job site and provide long-term support there to check in, see how things are going, if the person has disclosed that they have a disability and the employer is aware of your support. It could be that you're representing someone who doesn't want to disclose that they have a disability. They never tell their employer. If they don't tell their, nobody has to disclose that they have a disability to their employer but make sure that you and they also understand that they are not protected by the Americans with Disabilities Act if they don't disclose. But you'll have some people that don't wanna disclose and then some people who do and you'll be very active in the job search process. During the first 180 days on the job, you wanna complete your documentation on this stable employment activity note. Again, you have your activity, purpose, results, and next step that should look very familiar by now. During the first 90 days on the job, you're gonna turn these notes in on a monthly basis to the VR counselor. From day 91 through day 180, you can keep these notes in your own files at your agency, and they'll only be looked at maybe during an audit down the road or if the counselor were to ask for them. At 30 days on the job, you want to turn in those monthly stable employment activity notes along with this 30-day stable employment summary form to the VR counselor. And those get turned in with an invoice for $1,000 made payable to your agency. At 60 stable days on the job, this is when you're gonna turn in your next summary. They call the 60-day stable summary a long-term support plan and it's more involved. By this point, the person has been working on this job for two months, so the supported employee and you know a lot more about the realities of this job. So this is your chance to form a plan of what support's gonna look like over the long-term. Once this plan is completed, You'll turn in your stable employment activity notes for day 30 through day 60, along with this form and an invoice for $2,000 to be made payable to your agency. This is the content of the long-term support plan, logistical information. And then you wanna talk about your frequency and description of on-site services and supports that you are still providing to that employee. What kind of things are you doing? And then how are you planning to shift those tasks to the employee or to other natural supports? And in what way and how often are you following up with the employee and the employer? Then you want to do the same for off-site services and supports. You might still be providing transportation, but maybe you've been providing transportation and now you're helping them make connections with coworkers that live in the same part of the county that they can carpool with. Or maybe you're hooking them up with someone else who has a car that they're able to pay a small gas stipend to give them a ride to work. Whatever those offsite services and supports might be. It might be that somebody just wants to get together for a cup of coffee once a month and talk about what's going on at work. How are they getting along with other people? Which parts of the job are causing them more stress? Whatever that looks like is what you'll write up here. And then any natural supports. Natural supports are supports that exist within the job place 
that nobody is paid to do, right? So it might be a mentor that they have that they can go and ask questions to. It might be that someone has offered to help them use the um, clock when they get in so that they can clock in when their shift ends and clock out when their shift is over. It might be that they have trouble reaching items on a certain shelf and so they have somebody or a few somebodies that they can ask for help with when they need to be able to do that. What are those natural supports? If you think about it, we all have natural supports on the job. It's those people at our workplace who help us to be better at our jobs. You want to talk about whether the, per the person's future employment goals. It might be that they started with this job to get their foot in within this company because they really want a job higher up. What are you doing to set them up to be able to apply for that next level position? Or it might be that somebody's getting used to the job and they want to get to know their coworkers better. They want to increase their efficiency. Or maybe after two months on the job, it might take them longer than other people to learn tasks at first. But by now, they've got it down and it's time to add tasks to their workload to keep their number of hours busy. And then how is input obtained for this plan? Making sure you're talking to that employee, perhaps their employer, a guardian, or other family members or friends. As a side note, if this person is going to have long-term support services funded by a Medicaid waiver, SCL, Michelle P, ABI, then this plan needs to be developed by the individual's team. It becomes a part of their plan of care. Just a couple slides here, only for those of, this one is just for those of you who will help people who have access to the SCL waiver. There's a certain number of units that you can provide long-term support no questions asked. If you want to provide more than that over the course of a month, it's going to need to be approved by CareWise. So you're going to need to document and justify why this person needs that level of support. Then you still want to include what you do to support their work and what you're doing to help them become more independent. This is not a list of negative behavior someone has or the fact that their parent wants you with them all the time. That's not what Medicaid pays for. If it's because this person has all kinds of issues and problems and negative behaviors and they wander off, perhaps it's not the best job fit for that person and you need to find another place of employment where that's not the case. But some people will, at least for a while, need a higher level of support and so this is where you justify that. This is what Medicaid is looking for that you see on this screen. And you wanna be specific about your goal to reduce your support and what it is that you're doing to support and promote independence on the job to the capacity that this person can be. Back to Voc Rehab. At 90 days on the job, you're gonna send your stable employment activity notes for days 60 through 90. A 90-day summary, the format looks just like the 30-day summary we saw a moment ago, except it says 90-day at the top. And then an invoice for $2,000. This is your agency's final fee from vocational rehabilitation. At this point, once your agency receives that $2,000 payment, you have exhausted funds from vocational rehabilitation and can switch to other funding sources. Remember we talked about how Medicaid is always the payer of last resort. Once you have billed this final $2,000 payment, there is no more money from Voc Rehab, and so Medicaid will now pay and fund those long-term support services. Per federal regulations, you do still need to turn in monthly summaries at 120 days on the job, again at 150 days on the job, and at 180 days on the job to the VR counselor. You are welcome to keep those stable employment activity notes with you in your agency to just be looked at if they want them, but you do need to turn in the monthly summaries. Your agency will get that final payment at day 90 on the job, but the counselor won't close the case successful with the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation until they've been stable on the job for 180 days. At this point, your role isn't finished. 
long-term follow-up and support is what makes supported employment unique. It's not just that you help somebody get a job, help them learn it, and then you're gone. But it's gonna look different for everybody. That's what we mean by individualized. Your long-term support plans should not look the same for all of the clients supported by your agency. They really need to be proactive so that you got to know this person well during person-centered job selection, and then you helped them find this job, talked with the employer, maybe negotiated what the tasks would look like. So it makes sense that you're the person providing this long-term support, so you can be proactive. You know what the expectations are. If you start to see the person not doing the job the way they used to, dropping back a little bit, jump in there and find out why. If their motivation is failing after a while and they're getting bored, it might be time for another job. If you do this in a reactive manner, it's oftentimes too late if somebody's gotten in trouble at work and you weren't made aware of it. These services are provided indefinitely, but that does not mean one-on-one -on -one support forever. You want to support each person in a way that makes sense to them. And again, the minimum is checking in twice a month, and one of those should be in person. Your ongoing documentation for long-term supports is going to vary based upon your agency, where it is you work, and who that funding source is. But maintaining records is always critical to good services in a way to show what it is you're doing and making sure that other people are aware of what's going on in that job. For those of you using a Medicaid waiver, Michelle P and also ABI, um, follow the top line. It is limited to 40 hours a week alone or in combination with other services. And that counts their work hours along with those services for the week. SCL does not allow um, you to exceed 16 hours a day of employment in conjunction with other paid day services. This is the note format for those Medicaid waivers. This is what they're looking for. All of this you should learn more about from your agency. Um, the case manager will have access to this information. And again, if you go to your Dropbox, there's a um, contact sheet of people who can help with lots of parts of supported employment. There are several people listed under contacts if you receive Medicaid waiver services. Jeff White, who's listed on there, is the main point person within DDID, Division of Developmental Intellectual Disabilities here in Kentucky. He's the point person for employment services within that waiver. So if you have con questions about this part of documentation or how to get these services approved, he's a good person to talk to. Keeping in touch with that Case manager is always really important so that they know how many units to allow in the plan for long-term support once VR stops paying. If somebody loses a job or wants a different job, it is our obligation in supported employment to help them through that process. VR is not going to pay you again to provide the same services they've paid once. Sometimes there are some exceptions to that if a lot has changed within that person's life. But in general, VR and supported employment just happens once. If someone has a Medicaid waiver, you can use that funding source or other funding sources you might have for long-term supports and repeat the same type of service that you did through VR. Again, it's still, what did you learn about this person and the job they had? that can build upon what you're gonna look for in a next job. For Michelle P and ABI waiver, there's just one long-term support code. For SEL, you can see those codes in front of you for the different types of service. Within the vocational rehabilitation system, once someone has been stable on the job for one year, 12 months, they're eligible for step-down supports. People do not have to apply for step-down support. If someone is working on the job, they're fine. They don't need you checking in on them two times a month, and you're really driving out to see that person in order to meet that VR requirement, that's a good sign that they're a good applicant for step-down supports. There is an application, which you'll find in your Dropbox, um, that you would fill out saying what the alternative 
alternate level of support is going to be. Maybe you're just going to check in with somebody quarterly. Maybe you'll talk to them each month on the phone or through text message or email, but you're not going to see them as often. What's it going to look like for that person? This application gets turned into your supported employment consultant. Supported employment consultants are also listed by name and contact information in your Dropbox. These are people who are VR employees who are there to be a liaison between provider agencies of supported employment and VR counselors, the VR agency. Remember, at 180 days on the job, this person's case closed with Folk Rehab, so they don't have a VR counselor anymore. That's why this application gets turned into the Supported Employment Consultant. If that application is improved, your su supports reduce, and something were to happen. They have a problem at work, they get a promotion, and now they need more help in learning the new tasks, whatever it might be. Now you go back to that first level requirement of support. Once they're stable in this new part of the job or the new job, then you could reapply for step-down supports again. Just some general expectations. Every year, the contract that your agency signs has the stipulations to be a vendor, they call it, an agency that provides supported employment services for VR in Kentucky. It also has a list of expectations around best practice. You can find that list in your Dropbox. For example, one of the expectations on there is that employment specialists will meet with at least three employers per week. This goes back to that job development phase. If you're not out there talking to employers, people are not likely to get jobs. So that's one of the expectations that VR has is for active communication, conversation, networking with employers. Vendor agencies also have to accept at least five new referrals per year in order to be active vendors with Folk Rehab. That's not per employment specialist, that's for the whole agency. If for some reason your agency has trouble meeting that number, have a conversation with your supported employment consultant, but that is the expectation. The other expectation for all employment specialists, so that's all of you listening to this training, is that you have to receive at least 15 hours of continuing education on an annual basis. That follows the VR contract year, which is July 1st through June 30th. Now you are gonna receive more than 15 hours of education as a part of this core training series. So you're set for this year, but starting the next July 1st, you're gonna need 15 additional hours. Once you come through this training, you get on an email list that I maintain, and you will receive not often, but regular updates about how to find other continuing education opportunities. There are in-person trainings, there are online trainings, some of them have a fee, some of them are free, some of them are at set times, some of them are pre-recorded to watch on your own schedule. There's more than enough opportunity out there for education around disability and employment that you should be able to get 15 hours in every year. And again, anytime you have questions or issues, you're able to, you're always welcome to contact me. Again, I'm Katie Wolf Whaley and I provide this training. I can also help answer questions down the road as can your supported employment consultants. You have now completed this first segment of online learning through the supported employment core training series. Make sure that you finish the associated activities with this segment, the additional online segments, and I look forward to meeting you at the in-person training that you will come to next.